Hi, my name is Peter. I'm an emergency medicine resident in Stockholm, currently from Denmark. Um, today I want to talk to you about OMI, occluding myocardial infarction. This is a concept that has been airing on the, uh, the social media and uh, FOMED world uh, for a couple of years now, uh, spearheaded by Dr. Smith from Dr. Smith's ECG block and Pendle Myers uh, and a few others. Um, I want to focus on the more clinical aspects of this um, poss possible paradigm um, shift and how we should um, be aware of certain ECG changes um, that are um, that are that are changes that should consider uh, that, yes, that should make us consider calling the PCI uh, cardiologists, the interventionalists, um, and. I, uh, I am going to um, briefly touch on uh, the argument of why we should change or why we should consider changing to the OMI paradigm. Um, but for a more thorough uh, argumentation and discussion of, of this uh, argument of why we should change, I suggest that you go to the um, um, very thorough OMI manifesto, uh, which is uh, which can be found on Dr. Smith's ECG blog, or the videos that uh, he and Pendle Myers have done uh, on uh, MCRIT Scott Weingart's page, um, or uh, on Dr. Smith's ECG blog's video page. As always, I want to make sure that uh, you know that I have no conflicts of interest in this matter. Um, I do not get any money from anyone for, for doing this. Um, I am um, a board member of uh, IDEM, uh, Young Danish Emergency Physicians, um, and I am an instructor in, in the Emergency Medicine Core Competences course uh, from Lund uh, through a couple of years. Um, I also want to make sure that you know that uh, I and my colleagues have written about this topic on acutemedicinan.dk. Um, and we've written about a lot of the background aspects that I'm going to discuss, uh, among others, uh, probabilistic thinking uh, on our homepage. We are also making podcasts and we are uh, doing um, videos. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the blogs, most of the blogs are in Danish and um, Many of you have asked me to make videos in English, and that's why I've started making videos from both on my own YouTube channel, uh, the um, the um, um, uh, which, which can be reached by uh, um, by um, YouTubing my name, Peter Thompson, and for instance, writing probabilistic thinking headache, which is one of the videos, and then you can come to my. Um, YouTube channel and check out the, the video archive. Uh, Acutemedicinan.dk also has a video page on YouTube where, where a lot of my videos, um, among others, um, has been posted. Uh, so please check that out if you're interested. Um, there's also um, the blog about this specific topic, OMI. Um, and that can be found on acutemedicinan.dk, but it's still in Danish, and that's partly why I'm doing this video so that um, it can, th this topic can reach a broader community um, among emergency physicians in Scandinavia. Most of what I'm going to say I have from uh, these sources, um, and as I um, briefly uh, told you just before, I suggest that you check out some of these sources um, for um, more detailed discussion on the background um, uh, background on the OMI uh, aspect. And, and, and if there's any um, questions or if I'm saying something that is ambiguous or not co entirely correct, um, I, I suggest that you go to these uh, sources to uh, straighten it out. In general, on the topic, if you want to know more about the OMI, um, I suggest that you um, check out um, these sources. And 
for in general cardiology, cardiology and emergency medicine and the patient with chest pain, ischemic chest pain, um, dysarrhythmias, or uh, any kind of emergency cardiology. I suggest these uh, sources, especially um, especially Simon Carly, Rick Buddy, Amalma 2, and uh, first 10 EMs um, for more of a broader emergency medicine discussion about how to utilize um, and how to balance overdiagnosis with underdiagnosis and getting that sweet spot. Um, Bernard Laun and Dr. Mandrola are cardiologists, or um, Bernard Laun uh, died recently, um, bless his soul, and they have blocks. Um, both of them, and they are very much worth checking out as well, uh, as they um, have many of the same um, um, topics and mindsets as 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 the other uh, mentioned here. Um, Dr. Smith's ECG blog is sublime, and I've already mentioned that. Um, also, I wanted to, I want to um, uh, just emphasize that. EM Cases has an ECG page where you can um, learn um, much of what I'm going to say here today. You can learn it through case-based learning, and I highly recommend going in there and checking those ECGs and uh, ECG block out. So on to the topic of today, and the main thing about this OMI um, paradigm shift lies in these two um, numbers that I'm going to show here. So 75% of STEMI patients need an emergent PCI. That might not be too controversial, but what is more controversial is that 25% of non-STEMI patients needs an emergency PCI. Think about that. That means that around one in four of the patients that we uh, see with acute ischemic chest pain um, who has an including myocardial infarction do not get the emergent PCI that they actually need. And what is going to be um, assumed through this lecture uh, is that we actually can uh, pick up a lot of these um, these patients without uh, without without vastly overdiagnosing um, the the group and actually making a benefit if we know a couple of tricks in the ECG book. <laughs> Before jumping into the main topic, I just wanted to err on the Bayesian thinking concept, which I um, which you might know through my different other blogs or YouTube um, videos, um, but I want to do it from a cardio cardiological emergency um, medicine aspect this time. So one of the main things in Bayesian thinking is the concept that things are not a, a dichotomy, it's, it's a spectrum. Patients do not have diseases, they have probability of diseases, and a test it's just a test. You cannot judge a test without actually knowing about the pretest probability and assessing that. Um, the test can only be assessed in context. And the ECG is a great example. So is, this ECG, you might, the keen observer might um, have seen that there are um, ST um, elevations in the inferior leads. And there might even be some reciprocal, uh, reciprocal uh, AVR and uh, lead two uh, reciprocal changes, and maybe even AVL and lead three. Um, what? What? And and my my question to you is: Is this a significant elevation or not? Well, it significant um, it depends. Uh, does this represent an ECG that needs to go to the cath lab? Is a more um, is a is a more important question, and f to answer that, we need to know about the precess probability. What kind of patient is this? If I came to you with um, 
if, if I came to you with this patient and they had a similar ECG, ECG um, uh, five years ago and they were, they were stable then and did not have any occluding myocardial infarction then, then I bet you would not think that they should go to the cath lab, cath lab immediately. So the test needs to be seen in context and that is the essence of Bayesian thinking. Let's go a bit further, further with this uh, ECG uh, to, hammer how, to, to hammer home the, uh, the point that I'm trying to make. Um, in the middle, we have the uh, Fagan's normogram, uh, which I've been uh, using uh, for uh, both blocks and videos, um, previous videos and blocks. And, and I won't go into details explaining this, but this is a very good tool to learn Bayesian thinking. Um, I do not suggest that you walk around with the Fagan's normogram in your pocket in, during um, your clinical um, uh, clinical work, but I think it's a really, really good tool to learn uh, the concepts, and that's why I'm going to uh, use it here as well. So let's say that we have two different patients. One of our patients is a 20-year-old patient who comes to the um, the private practice physician uh, because he has having uh, he's been having a bit of chest pain on and off um, for the last couple of months. And he can point to his chest with one finger where it hurts. And maybe even the patient's pain is reproduced by um, touching this area. Um, he has no risk factors um, and no family history of sudden death. Well, a patient like this, we would categorize in general as having a very low pretest probability. Um, before during the test, which is the ECG. Um, in this case, we might have other tests we, which could replace the ECG. That might be different questions that we might ask and different blood samples we could, uh, could take and different uh, objective uh, findings that we might find or examinations that we might do. So the test can be anything here. Um, but in this case, uh, for this lecture, um, we're only talking about ECGs. Okay, the other patient might be a 50-year-old patient with a typical chest pain um, coming, um, not coming abruptly, but smoothly um, increasing over a few, a few minutes uh, with sweating uh, and, um, and with uh, pain despite his uh, nitroglycerin um, puffers. And um, the pain is not relieved by just sitting down. Uh, and he's presenting to the emergency department uh, during the night time here. So uh, this patient, who um, uh, we were a bit more uh, worried about because there's a high precess probability that this patient has a um, ECG um, that might suggest um, uh, occluding myocardial infarction. So when we talk about the tests, we Let's, for argument's sake, say that a ST elevation, a significant ST elevation, has a, um, a, um, a likelihood ratio, positive likelihood ratio of 10, which um, is around that mark in, in some sources. But there's a wide, wide uh, margin of um, variability here. But let's say, for, for argument's sake, say that it's 10. Then we have um, the same test, the same ECG in diff two different patients, um, uh, meaning different things uh, or gi uh, giving us different post-test probabilities. And that is the essence of, a, of the Bayesian thinking that uh, the test is actually not uh, anything. We cannot interpret a test without knowing what kind of patient stands in front of us. The, um, so for the first patient here, with the low precess observability, an ECG with these changes um, would put him in a category of maybe, let's just say, five or ten percent of a of a um, uh, ACS or an occluding myocardial infarction. Um, meanwhile, um, meanwhile, all other patients with the same ECG findings, we are much more worried. Um, especially if the findings are new. So there's there's a so, so the uh, take home point here is um, it's really important that uh, we know uh, we, we do a good assessment to assess the pretest probability and know what kind of signs and symptoms are really 
uh, important in terms of getting that precess variability so that we can do a thorough assessment of the precess variability before interpreting the, the tests that we're using. Um, and that, as I've alluded to in previous videos about communication and gathering this information, that it's really important that we gather this information in a high quality way so that we don't, as you might say, lead the victim, ask too specific questions too early on, unless unless the history is obvious. And it's a very, very rarely that the history is obvious in the emergency department. Okay, let's just take a few more aspects about the Bayesian thinking and the ECG. So let's take our patient again here, the 50 year old typical chest pain patient here, who presents in your um, emergency department diaphoretic um, and profuse sweating. Um, so let's say that the ECG showed ST elevations which were, which were significant and with, even with reciprocity in the um, um, re reciprocal leads, uh, which we'll talk about in short. Um, then you would have your high pre-test sorry post-test probability, and this patient was almost would almost certainly with such a history go to the cath lab. Um, let's say that the ECG showed a bit less significant changes. Let's say that it showed insignificant ST elevations without recipro recipro reciprocity uh, and not having any of the OMI criteria that we're going to talk about. Maybe just some. Um, maybe just some minor ST changes or uh, some T wave inversions. Um, then, then the same patient will have a lot lower pre-test post-test probability, though it wouldn't rule out or rule in anything. But this is a patient where you might want to wait for troponins, depending on whether the patient will get uh, pain-free on, on nitro. Let's say that the ECG was totally normal um, and of course it always depends on when in the chronological um, uh, like when in the chronology that the, the ECG has been taking uh, has been taken but in general you you will see that I just take a number here I, I, I know I don't know of a um, that many studies that are uh, checking um, normal ECGs um, I don't know the likelihood ratio here but for for argument's sake a pre-test probability of 50 and a normal ECG uh, just even if the test was moderately good um, then it would not rule out um, so if you have a high enough pre-test probability then your patient with a um, normal uh, moderately good test would not rule it out um, we still have a 20% risk of ACS and that is not good enough so that would be a definitely admission but maybe not a PCI unless uh, dynamic changes um, occur. Another aspect of Bayesian thinking is the con the concept that there's the like there's the um, the post test probability, um, and there's an area we might we might sometimes be. This is an this is a lecture about ACS or occluding myocardial infarction and. And we might think that everything that we see is ACS sometimes when we have a chest pain patient that we might anchor. Um, we might have a lot of cognitive biases, um, um, among others, anchoring and premature closure. So that we think that ACS is the only diagnosis, but it's important to utilize what we would call forcing strategies. And one of those forcing strategies to think a bit broader about the more dangerous mimics um, uh, would be to think of it in terms of the Fagan's nomogram here that all like the sum of all diagnosis that the patient's um, symptom presenting symptom can 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 uh, can represent um, sums up to 100 all the benign cases all the um, uh, less benign like the more time sensitive cases all of them they create they sum up to 100 um, assuming that the patient does not have more than one disease, um, which is um, which definitely is possible. But for simple for um, for argument's sake, let's say that the patient only has one thing that is causing uh, the symptoms. Then you um, can force yourself to. Add, you can 
as a forcing strategy, ask yourself, well, um, so the ECG uh, shows that there's this, um, and it, it really does seem like this is a um, ACS. Well, um, so post-test probability of 90%, then there's 10% risk of this maybe being something else that might that you might want to work up as well, um, depending on your treatment and diagnostic thresholds. That might there might be a aortic dissection hiding here. Um, maybe the, all of this is true, but the pain came abruptly and radiated to the um, back. And same the same ECG with ST elevation reciprocity um, was uh, was was uh, evident. Then. Then probably you would you would consider maybe if there's only a five percent uh, chance of this being an aortic dissection, then you would still consider doing the um, uh, the uh, CT of uh, the CT angiogram of the aorta before doing the cath lab, uh, depending on your resources and depending on the setting, of course. But it's just something to uh, it's a concept to think about and and sometimes these things are missed because we do not think about uh, forcing strategies and anchor too quickly on a diagnosis um, for specifically for chest pain I've just written the uh, the, the, the dangerous um, um, six uh, causes besides uh, ACS, which is PE, pericarditis, and myocarditis, aortic dissection, pneumothorax, and Borkhoff's syndrome, esophagus, esophageal rupture. Some people may add uh, upper GI bleed, which is in the same area, and pneumonia as well. Um, then, and then you have all the benign stuff uh, besides that. Of course, this concept becomes more and more important. Um, the the lower your poster probability is and the less sure you are of your main diagnosis. Um, also bear in mind that in emergency medicine, we don't go after the highest probability, uh, the, the most probable diagnosis. It's nice if we can find it um, and help the patient with it. But in general, we're trying to f find some of the more time critical, time sensitive stuff. And that's usually much less um, likely. But likely enough that we want to work out, work it up and treat it if it's uh, not possible to get a final diagnosis in the emergency department. Okay. The forcing strategies I was talking about are, this, this is an important concept that I use myself a lot to try to mitigate for some of these cognitive biases that we do uh, all um, have a, um, and, and a, 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 we, we're all prone to these as humans. And we're not find a effective evidence-based way yet to actually um, effectively um, mitigate these in the emergency department. Uh, if you want to know more about this, I've made a video about it. And Patrick Crossgury's work especially is very, um, is very important here. And, and, and that's probably the source I would suggest um, the first. Other uh, sources are Gary Klein, uh, a cognitive psychologist, and um, Daniel Kahneman um, as well, um, among others. Um, also, Chris Hicks from Canada has made a lot of good studies and uh, um, and and videos about this these concepts. Some of my forcing strategies that I would suggest uh, that I would recommend are the thing the, the, the forcing strategy that I just mentioned what makes up the other so and so percent of um, of the diagnostic spectrum um, for instance if you have uh, your ACS patient and there's a pretty high chance that this is ACS but there are different uh, differential diagnoses that are uh, hiding in the um, in in the uh, the um, in the rest of the <laughs> amount of the hundred percent, um, so it, it can be good to ask your uh, you yourself or your learner. Um, okay, so you think this is the main diagnosis? Um, how much would you value it? Um, how much would you say estimate estimate it to? Is it a hundred percent? It's rarely a hundred percent, so it's almost always somewhere between ninety nine percent and one percent, and. So is it like 80%? Okay, if it's 80%, what are the rest of the 20%? What does this represent? Is there something that we need to work up there? That's a good way to kind of open up your way of thinking about this. Then there's the, um, it's not that 
force and strategy. And if you have a strategy, if you have a diagnosis that you're set on, it's so obvious, it's a slam dunk, then sometimes it's impor important to just stop and ask yourself, well, as a like force of God, a thunderbolt from the clouds comes and say, tells you, definitely this is not diagnosis. Your the CT scan that you order comes back negative, or your test that you did uh, that you order it comes back totally negative, um, and that's a good test. So so what is it then? That's also a way of kind of kind of opening up your way of thought. And then uh, s smart checklists, which I've also done a video on, can um, often um, help us as well to to force us to to think about a wider aspect, wider, wider differential. Um, of course, there's a there's a balance here between system one and system two thinking. This is system two forcing strategies, trying to um, trying to um, trying to um, survey or su make surveillance on the uh, system uh, one um, or, or the, the yeah the system one, but sometimes you can get too analytical so there, there's a, definitely a, a balance here but from time to time it's important um, to stop up and, and think about these things so this is a um, another way of um, illustrating what i just um, talked to you about um, this is what i would call the um, landscape of differential diagnoses um, and so if we have a patient with chest pain coming to our emergency department, then if I don't know anything about this um, patient, maybe beside her her age, then and, and her presenting symptom, um, assuming that this is the symptom that is representative representative of her most m most representative of her um, complaint, um, which is not not always the case, then then. Then we, from studies on patients arriving at the emergency department, we know that the precess probability would be ACS, uh, for, for ACS would be around 10%. Or the dissection would be around maybe below um, 1%. And PE would be a couple of percent, maybe 2 or 5%. Um, the rest of the time critical diagnosis I have um, in, in this column. And um, so the most likely benign courses would be musculoskeletal pain. So, just to just to show you that a test doesn't have to be a um, a paraclinical test or a a, a, um, a examination. It can be a question. So, and 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 I would argue that just as a, an examination uh, can be higher or lower quality depending depending on your expertise, uh, the way that we ask our questions uh, also comes with a margin of quality or margin of, or 95 percent confidence interval uh, where uh, or an insurator reliability as you might say as well where certain certain um, uh, doctors are um, are more skilled at gathering information and i think this is a skill that can be honed it can be learned it's not something that you're just born with um, but if you ask a very specific question like is the pain worse with inspiration let's let's ignore how this information is gathered let's just say that high quality information it's gathered in a good way the pain is worse with inspiration the patient tells you this spontaneously you don't have to you don't have to leave the victim so to speak then uh, your the risk of this being ACS um, uh, goes down and the order dissection goes even further down your pe risk goes up and the musculoskeletal pain goes up and the others well maybe pericarditis is hiding in somewhere as well goes up as well um, as i alluded to before we in emergency medicine want to think about the most uh, dangerous so even though this is the most likely then we want to make sure that the most dangerous stuff the most likely especially the most likely of the most dangerous stuff in the in the case um, is is below a certain threshold um, this threshold we would call the diagnostic threshold and that is different depending on a lot of factors um, but mainly depending on patient factors like um, is this a patient that can go through um, certain uh, examinations certain uh, treatments and so on 
is uh, and and the diagnostics um, like is this a di diagnostic t uh, do we have a really good diagnostic test that can actually uh, rule out or rule in and is it is it is it a dangerous test um that would um and and then the the disease itself is this a pe which is quite dangerous but not as dangerous as an aortic dissection um these things makes the diagnostic uh, threshold shift up and down for the different conditions for the different patient and that's why we might work up different patients differently and not just according to some standardized guideline because patients are best treated equal uh, are, are most likely equally treated when they are treated differently according to a medical expertise of course guided by guidelines but not uh, forced by guidelines Okay. Um, the diagnostic threshold, in other words, is you often defined as where the harm benefit ratio is the same. So if you have a harm benefit ratio, that is, if, if you after a thorough pre test probability workup, you, you are now at a um, at a, a crossroad where you decide that do we need to do this test maybe a d-dimer maybe an ecg or maybe depending on the clinical scenario and the pre-test probability and the patient in front of you and the risk do we need to do this test or not well if the patient after a thorough workup is is below uh, the diagnostic threshold then it's probably going to cause them more harm than benefit and then you would probably suggest to do, use the time as a test and make them come back if you can um, or just make them follow up by a physician that knows them better um, and this is this is important extremely important aspect of emergency medicine that is that is often utilized too little um, um, there are even um, studies suggesting that if we do work up these patients when we go below the diagnostic threshold that there are not even, not only harm but there are also high risk of pre of, of over diagnosis um, um, and anxiety and so on sometimes we can not um, we cannot um, um, avoid doing these tests for different reasons that might be time constraint um, that might be um, patient uh, patients worrying so much that their life has been in in, in crumbles because of um, they, they cannot rest before getting this test and you might not have the time or resources to actually discuss this with them and in these cases I would sometimes give the patient the test with a with a very thorough information about why we're that why we're doing it and the risks of it and and for that, that the fact that we're only looking for a very specific thing um, that might be headache patients looking for a ct scan um, that are desperate to know and uh, sometimes you cannot come through um, therapeutically before having done one of these tests uh, because um, they have been set on it for so long um, but these are um, special cases and in general i would say that if you're below the diagnostic threshold you should not do the tests okay so the bayesian rule is in the diagnostic context patients do not have a disease they only have a probability of disease and the diagnostic tests that we're using diagnostic tests here being very widely um, defined as um, history clinical examination um, basic background information um, paraclinical test anything that, can, that has a likelihood ratio attached to it um, are, are merely revisions of probabilities and the sum of all diagnoses are 100 percent so um, the thresholds model that i just described from kishira is very important and every time the the, the likelihood ratio sorry the likelihood of one diagnosis goes up uh, others must come down sometimes we can utilize this in emergency medicine for instance in the dizzy patient where you're not quite sure whether this is a vertigo that should be worked up as an acute vestibular syndrome with hints tests or it's a more um, episodic um, um, 
uh, episodic dissonance syndrome or vertical syndrome um, um, more more likely to be worked off as a BPPV. Well, sometimes I would suggest doing the um, the this whole pike maneuver in the, these patients because if you find a very high signal um, positive finding uh, that suggests this very likely diagnosis of BPPV, then the the, the, the likelihood that it is BPPV goes up enormously, and by ruling that in, you rule out the other disease. The thing is here that if the patient has more than one diagnosis, which would be Hickenstictum, um, and in this case, maybe the patient who has had um, BPV in the past, maybe a couple of months ago, and now presents with dizziness, then it's more ambiguous because they might have a positive BPV test, uh, this whole pike test uh, from before, but uh, also have um, an AVS on top of that. Um, and that's where it gets more tricky. That is that is a, um, a clinical um, expertise kind of um, consideration. But you get my point, I think. Then all tests need to be seen in context, as we talked about. And that means both history taking, and I'm talking about the quality of history taking, don't lead the victim with specific questions too early on, unless it's a very high signal history. Let the patient talk with, um, with open-ended questions in the beginning. Make sure that you have good body language so that the patient feels free to communicate and don't interrupt them in the beginning of the um, uh, conversation use validation of what they're uh, what what the, of the pain or the suffering that they're describing because of course you need to validate uh, if a patient is, su is suffering in front of you um, and manage expectations early on so that they know what they can expect in an emergency department and they're not waiting waiting in vain um, especially if they're in pain and uh, we not, might not be able to stop their pain all the time. Okay, so that is the history taking which can be seen as a test in itself and you as a physician being a good communicator is a, is a, is a test uh, that uh, can be better or worse depending on your skills in this area. Then your examination findings um, as well also with a attached quality depending on your experience with different kind of examinations um, and then the pre the, the paraclinical tests which are less prone to intraday reliability than the above but still um, um, still a lot of both intraday reliability and uh, intra radar meaning if you came back on the same day you want you might um, interpret the same ECG differently and well that is the complex environment that we work within. Um, but to, in order to to assess all of these things, whether it would be a, a student saying that this patient complains of pleuritic chest pain, um, you have to um, assessing the risk of maybe PE, then you would have to um, assess the, the patient's pre-test probability and the the specific information, the test that if you ask the patient, is, is your patient, is, is your chest pain pleuritic, um, um, then then that is a test on in of itself, and and the precess probability um, would um, suggest which how much it, it 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 weighs on the on the overall risk of PE. Um, the same thing with these um, objective examination findings, whether you can palpate uh, your, whether you're a patient with uh, diaphoretic, uh, who is diaphoretic, a uh, 60 year old smoking chest pain, um, then whether you can palpate their chest and uh, say that, well, the, a lot of the pain is reproduced um, by palpating the chest, then it's probably and not good enough to rule out in, in, in this particular case. Uh, so it all depends on the pretest probability. Or does it? Well, there's this concept of signal and noise, which I've also talked about and is and, and is thoroughly discussed in Nate's Silver uh, Nate Silver's book, uh, The Signal and the Noise. And 
is it really always depends are then is there no test that is so obviously obviously wrong that i mean that that is that there must be some kind of pathology about it well if you look at this ecg for instance then yes the i i guess there are some tests that are, that are so high signal that they are beyond what you would you would think would be normal range um but i would still suggest that in order to um, for it to make sense you do need some clinical context nevertheless um and so most most of the time even with very high signal things in uh, data pieces of data you need, it's still it can still be noisy and most of our data is very noisy and we need to know the clinical context okay on to part two and the uh, omi discussion of this so this was kind of a prelude to the main topic here today and so what is the problem with the current STEMI non STEMI paradigm these are the classical criteria for um, the, for for the um, the last couple of years, I think it's since 2000, maybe slightly updated through the last couple of year, last 20 years or so. But in general, not, nothing much has been changed. Um, the original uh, STEMI non-STEMI criteria they uh, replaced the uh, Q wave non-Q wave criteria, and technology has everything to do with um, the change because um, before. Uh, the thrombolytics area or the uh, reperfusion area all you could do was was to um, acknowledge that there was an ecg chain suggesting um, q wave or non-q wave and uh, which had a prognostic uh, indication um, or quality um, then when the perfusion area area uh, sorry the uh, reperfusion era came um, the uh, thrombolytics made it possible and made it important that we could um, uh, distinguish which patients might need thrombolytics and which would be less, which patient would need it uh, less and be in more risk of harm doing thrombolytics than than benefit. And that's from that the the STEMI non STEMI criteria were born. And if you want to know more, more about this history, you should check out Dr. Smith's um, video on this. Um, and the current criteria has not really been up uh, like um, in the PCI area era, and in the, in in the current area era where we uh, know a bit more about which patient actually needs uh, um, uh, uh, PCI urgently. Um, they they have probably not. Been, that's the argument in the OMI criteria or the OMI argument anyway that they have not been updated. They are, are dino, They are a dinosaur of a um, past time. That is not to say that they're not important, and, and that's why we need to know them. Still, you might consider them being um, a high likelihood ratio finding uh, still. And uh, it's really important that we know these and can spot these and 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 um, send these to the cath lab. For an emergency physician in most centers now, these are picked up pre-hospitally. So usually we only see these uh, classical criteria uh, STEMIs if they are walk-ins, like they come and walking in, have not contacted um, contacted 911 or 112 in Scandinavia. Um, and that is why these are pretty rare um, uh, now, and the OMI criteria where we can actually, where where, where they are usually not screened pre-hospitally, pre as effectively anyway. Um, the, this is where we can actually make a change as emergency physicians, especially. Okay, but the the classical SC elevation criteria are that you need SC elevation in two contiguous leads at the J point. And then there's, uh, and it has to be over one millimeter in all leads besides V2 and V3, where there are, um, where it's all right for, especially young men to have a very um, high 
2.5 millimeter uh, elevation and um, a bit less for older men and um, uh, women. Um, that has something to do with muscle mass, I think. Then, then just to repeat, just to just to um, um, uh, make you remember that the J point uh, is def uh, kind of defined by uh, having a QRS complex, and then when the QRS complex ends, then the first horizontal line uh, is where you measure your um, ST elevation from. This point is called the J point, and so the ST segment is measured from the isoelectric um, uh, line here, and then up to the J point. And the J point can be different depending on how it looks, the QRS complex looks, and the, the ST deflection. But in general, it, it, as a it, it's it's always the um, the first horizontal line after the QRS complex. Um, there is one thing called the J wave here, which you can read up on yourself. It's something that comes before the J point when it's kind of slopey like this. Okay, so. In simple terms, in black and white terms, then what the STEMI criteria were made for is that if you have a patient that is STEMI, cri STEMI criteria positive, then you should do PCR and thrombolysis, and then you have your STEMI criteria negative patients, which should have either delayed PCI or conservative manage management. And um, the problem with this um, STEMI criteria has been. Um, one of the problems has been called the no false negative paradox, and I'll just try to tell you about this uh, quickly here. So, if you have a um, two by two table here where you have your your ST elevation on ECG, and you have your um, ECGs which do not have ST elevation, um, and then you have your and this is STEMI uh, sorry this is STEMI criteria significant um, like classical criteria uh, ST elevation, and then when you go to see go to the cath lab and you have you either had no occlusion and or you have an occlusion that needed to to um, be um, uh, be um, be removed by PCI, and then you can have your pa patient with, who has a STEMI and has an occlusion. Well, that's what we want to find. Great, that's what we would call a true positive STEMI. Then you have your um, your um, ST elevations on ECG, which are significant, but you, you don't have um, any occlusion. Then you either have pericarditis or manoka or some of the other things that that we might call STEMI, um, STEMI differential, uh, like, uh, or sorry, ST elevation differential diagnoses, or um, just false positives. Doesn't mean that they're not important, just means that they're not occluding myocardial infarctions. Okay, then if you have a uh, ST elevation negative patient who has no occlusion on their um, on their um, uh, ECG, uh, sorry, on their on their cath lab. Um, then, if there's uh, if if they do have troponin with dynamics, then you might call it an STEMI. If we don't have any other differential diagnosis uh, that might uh, like like PE. Um, if there's no trop troponin, um, but and they do have a suggestive history, you might call it insta instable angina pectoris. And if there's no trop troponin and no um, um, uh, no IIP, your uh, instable angina pectoris, then you would maybe if the history is suggestive, then you would call it just angina. Um, and work up of uh, check out also psychosocial causes and so on. Well. And here now we come to the like the crux of the matter, and the thing is, what do we do if we have a ST elevation negative patient, um, uh, not living up to the STEMI criteria, who does have an occlusion when we do the cath lab? Um, uh, what that that is, there is no space in the STEMI STEMI paradigm for this patient, um, and that's why we call it the no false negative paradox. New terminology would call this the S, this is an ST plus maybe an OMI and also an OMI plus sorry um, this would be called an ST minus but uh, but OMI plus because a lot of the criteria uh, we're not here we are assuming that the OMI would would pick up all of these and and 
uh, the OMI ECG criteria might not do that yet. We might not. We, there might still be some criteria that are not found yet. But in general, they, they, these take up a majority of, of uh, the false negative um, um, problems as we as we will see. The other ones here we would call ST negative nomi and ST positive nomi, and nomi meaning non occluding Marcarlian infarction. So here again, this important um, uh, data po uh, point here that around 75% of these patients in this box have uh, occluding Marcarlian infarction. Uh, sorry, in, in, in this one, uh, the rest being these, and around 25 of these, like um, uh, in, in this box, have occluding myocardial infarction. So, how do we find these? One of the um, one of the studies that Pendle Myers and uh, the Dr. Smith team has 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 done uh, is a is, is is low quality retros retrospective studies um, that are well made but it's low quality evidence um, and nonetheless but this is more and more evidence is coming on this area and but i think this is very telling this these these um th this graph um they took uh, a bunch of patients and um uh, with, with who had um who's gone through cath lab and tried to uh, see um whether the patients with um uh, STEMI uh, criteria and the patients with um, without STEMI criteria but with OMI criteria positive uh, had the same troponin leak and um, they it turned out that the patients who uh, were STEMI negative but OMI positive actually were quite similar to uh, the patients with uh, STEMI um, the true negatives being STEMI negative OMI negative and th so this th there there's at least a very uh, definite signal here that there's something going on um, that we're missing so you might call these high-risk feature ECGs um, and this would be the classical STEMI um, on Rebel EM's um, page um, you can also find uh, this um, um, graph here of this table from one of um, Pendelmeyer and I think Dr. Smith's um, studies um, where they um, made um, expert reviewers go through uh, ECGs um, with either STEMI criteria or OMI criteria uh, all of which had all of which uh, the patients who um, was in the study had gone through cath lab and uh, what it seemed to show was that the sensitivity of the OMI criteria were uh, vastly higher than the ones um, that, than than the um, the ones on the STEMI. So meaning that the STEMI criteria are as specific. If you have STEMI, then you have STEMI, and then you have an OMI probably. But if you don't uh, have STEMI, then there is still a chance that you might have an OMI or an occluding myocardial infarction, which needs a cath lab, and that's why the OMI criteria probably. Um, picks up a lot of more of these. It's important to notice that the insurator reliability and the external validity of these this particular study and in general this area uh, has not been thoroughly studied yet, um, to my knowledge. And whether we can learn this to as great a greater degree as the experts in in these studies is um, something that is debatable, but. I do think that we can, and that's why I'm doing this video where we can try to um, um, learn these um, the signs. This is from Dr. Smith's um, 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 article. You can find these articles in on his homepage where he goes, uh, where, where he has the link to them. Um, this is um, just another version of what I just showed you that if you have a patient with suspected ACS, then you can either have no um, ACS, which would be STEMI criteria um, and a, a true negative STEMI criteria, or you can have a STEMI criteria positive, which would be a false positive STEMI criterion. But these patients with ACS can either have acute MI, 
which would be a OMI and near total occlusion. And these could be STEMI positive or STEMI negative, but OMI um, positive nonetheless. This would be what we would call the STEMI negative patients, but the OMI, these are the ones that we really want to pick up on. Then you have the non-occlusion MI and uh, the, the NOMIs. And these might have, um, this might be the false positive ones, which would be pericarditis and so on, or a different ECG at baseline and so on. Or you might have the true negative STEMI criteria with the NOMI. Um, uh, which which um, may still need some cardiac workup, but they're not at least occluding. All right. And then you have your unstable anginas. Um, um, yeah. So the let's go through um, the concept of OMI or occluding myocardial infarction uh, from an ECG. The main concept here is that STEMI, non-STEMI is an ECG criteria, and this is more of a pathology criteria. Uh, the heart, uh, like summed up, the heart doesn't care what the ECG actually looks like. It cares whether there's an OMI or not. And the STEMI it doesn't seem to be specific, sorry, sensitive enough. It doesn't seem to pick up on enough patients. Um, um, and we, we seem to be missing uh, some people, um, some patients that could go through uh, with PCI and come out with better outcomes. And as always, this might be your brother or your sister or anyone you know. So these concepts are really important um, to, uh, to um, check out. So just to show you in another way, um, stable angina on the left in Danish, sorry. And unstable angina, and then non-STEMI and STEMI. That is the current, like the current mainstream paradigm, non-STEMI, STEMI. What we're suggesting is that the OMI, that's 75% of these, are um, false. Uh, oh, sorry, true positives. Here's the true, uh, sorry, the false um, positives, and here we have the um, false negatives, the ones that might be uh, OMIs actually. Uh, making up around 25%, um, needing the cath lab. And um, some of the ones here as well might go into this group, but we, with the new high sensitivity, high sensitivity tromponin, um, the, 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 the amount of patients being in stable angina without troponin leak are decreasing, or should be decreasing theoretically anyway. Um, but they probably do still exist, the patients without troponin leak um, that we actually, but that do have OMI. Uh, Dr. Smith uh, on Smith's ECG block at least uh, have a couple of cases where this is um, highly likely. Okay, so, and then we, yeah, as we talked, these are the, what we call STEMI equivalents, but we would now call um, ST negative, but OMI positive. So before looking at the ECGs for the rest of this lecture, I will just, um, I will just um, introduce to you the concept of uh, uh, interpreting ECGs through syndromes. So in the next slide, I will go through a more general way of going through ECGs, but you might want to go through them um, at a um, syndrome um, kind of way because just as we do our neurological exam we have a kind of a screening neurological exam if we don't have much um, much risk then you uh, and then you go into specific neurological exams like the dix hall pike tests if you have vertigo patients or you might be more thorough with your um, this coordination dysmetria um, examination if you have a dizziness patient then the same way if you have a patient with a specific complaint um, then you want to look a bit closer um, for that particular ECG, uh, sorry, presenting syndrome, syndrome or symptom, and you might have like chest, you might with ECG, uh, you might have things like chest pain, syncope, tachycardia, uh, or bradycardia, dyspnea, or intoxication. Okay, so with chest pain, um, we want to look for ischemia, and we'll look at uh, that in a little bit in a minute. We'll also look for arrhythmia that might cause chest pain or pericarditis. In syncope, you have the what Atul Gawande would call the obvious ones, like 
like you have your bradycardia, your AV blocks, and so on, uh, that jumps out. Then you have your more subtle ones that you need to keep a look out for. Out for. That would be the, what Atul Gawande has, um, what I would call Atul Gawande's four, um, which is QTC prolongation, which is um, Brugada syndrome, um, which is VPV or um, pre-excitation, and it would, would be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, then you have your um, dyspnea patients as well, and for these you want to, um, because dyspnea can be a presenting symptom of ACS, you want to look for ischemia as well. You want to look for the S S1Q3T3, which is, although it's not sensitive nor specific, um, so you probably want to look a bit more for right axis deviation, right bundle blanch block, uh, T negat negativity and uh, deviation and so on. Even Kosuke sign uh, might be helpful as well if you have uh, to differentiate between ACS and dyspnea. And in your tox patient, you want to look at the um, arrhythmia, the hypokalemia, and uh, digoxin uh, signs, um, Salvador Dali signs, and so on. Um, this is not a this is not a um, this is not a thorough walkthrough about uh, of these, but it's just to introduce the concept of that certain syndromes we want to look more specifically for certain things. Um, there's an entire book written by in a second uh, secondary a second edition now um, by um, Alan Matu among others and William Brady, and um, it's it's worth checking out. They go through um, the ECGs in this way: what kind of syndrome. Um, do you have and what kind of important stuff do you need to know about these syndromes? The more general way of interpreting an ECG, would, uh, in especially in emergency department, would go through probably something like this. Everyone, everyone does it differently, and I am not suggesting that you should do it in, as I do. Um, but I think as an emergency physician, we do pick up on most stuff doing it like this. Um, first of all, we need to assess the pre-test probability always. Um, then we need to. Um, then you, I, I always have like six questions I ask myself, and the four, four of them are arrhythmia ones. So, uh, is it sinus uh, rhythm or not? Uh, is it take your attack your? Uh, is it slow or fast? Is it wide or narrow, or is it regular or irregular? Doing this, you will. Um, you will come through to see um, your um, you, you you can you can bundle up your tachyarrhythmias in uh, narrow QRS in wide QRS and in regular or irregular and then you can kind of um, go through your um, uh, differentials uh, with these I will not go into details with this maybe this is a topic of an, for another another lecture um, for Danish speaking audience. Uh, Danny Yu has made a great video about this particular subject on the Acute Medicine on homepage. Um, so check, please check that out. For today's topic, we will be focusing on the ischemia things, which would be ST elevation, uh, or sorry, ST, uh, ST deviation, meaning both up and down, both elevation and depression, and Q waves, then T waves and bundle branch blocks. Um, and then something that I call neighbors, reci reciprocals, dynamics, and ratios. And I'll go into detail about these things. This is where you have to take the screenshot. This is the um, uh, this is the checklist for the uh, OMI criteria, probably either needing a direct activation of the cath lab or needing a consultation at least for the cath lab team. This might vary from your setting and maybe a lot of these are already picked up um, by cardiologists or by uh, experts at your center and then great. But in my experience, a lot of these are not known by our um, PCI centers and it's important for us as emergency physicians to um, not because we're better than our cardiologists, cardiologists at all, but because we read different literature and we sometimes think differently. And we have usually have the patient in front of us with this pretest probability assessment as well. And so, so, but we need to need to 
um, be able to share this knowledge and try to debate it so that we can give the patient the best um, treatment possible. Okay, um, so let's try to go through the um, SC elevation bit about this, the what I call neighbors, reciprocals, dynamics, and ratios. So this is one of my um, good friends who um, um, once sent me this ECG of a 100-year-old uh, guy. Um, and uh, the, um, the ECG here is <laughs> quite obviously pathological. This is one of the high signal ones. Um, and he even took a ECG a, a little a, a few minutes before where you, where we can see a change and so when we call our cath lab even though this might be obvious to us and what this is um, we might want to be able to speak the language that they that the cath lab needs uh, in order to get things going um, um, then a hundred year old guy might not uh, make a cath lab trip um, but um, let's let's for sake of argument to say that that the patient should go to the cath lab uh, if he if he needs it um, then we can um, but but then we need to be able to, to share this knowledge and, and why we like why, why can we make a strong diagnosis of uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction here uh, through the classical criteria well for this we need the the neighbors recipro reciprocals um, um, dynamics and ratios um, so let's talk about them here's another ECG just for um, for the sake of showing and what we have here um, we all one of the one of the key criteria for the classical STEMI um, paradigm was that uh, you need uh, to have ST elevation, significant ST elevation in two consecutive leaves. So the, the neighbor leads or the consecutive leaves, what are those? We have the inferior leads, which would be 2, 3, and AVF. We have the lateral leads, which would be um, 1, AVL, V5, and V6. And then we have the anterior leads, uh, sometimes also called V1 and V2, which is sometimes called the septal leads. And um, what, what we um, also see here is that the AVR does not have any um, uh, neighbor or um, uh, uh, does, not, does not have any neighbor leads because it's way up to um, the right uh, of the heart and seeing kind of a blind area um, where there's no uh, neighbor leads. Um, and this becomes important later on when we are talking about the OMI criteria when you have ST elevation in AVR. Okay, um, then also reciprocals are important to remember. And I, I always found it hard to remember the reciprocals um, because, um, all, especially since I moved to Sweden, as you'll see in a little bit, the ECGs are quite different there. And the gestalt of having this layout is is uh, gone when you move to a different country so it's nice to just have a, a couple of rule of thumbs about the reciprocals so so my rule of thumbs about the reciprocals are that um, so in the frontal pl plane which would be the green um, the green uh, uh, showed here um, the frontal plane of the heart uh, you will have your um, the reciprocals would be two and AVR, they're totally opposite each other, or almost totally. And then you have AVL and three. So these are the reciprocals in the frontal plane, um, meaning over over here. Um, then you have your um, uh, precordial plane or the, your uh, transverse plane. Um, and uh, there, there are two reciprocals that I always remember as well. Uh, there's the, um, there's the um, V6 and V1. And then there's the uh, um, the uh, the V1 to V4, which do not have any reciprocals. And if you have an infarct over here at the back wall of the heart, well, then then you don't and then you then you don't get any ST elevation. You only get the reciprocal change. So an ST elevation at one point would would um, give a reciprocal ST depression at the opposite point. That is the importance of the reciprocals. 
and this if you have uh, reciprocal change um, that means that, um, that, that 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 gives a high likelihood um, ratio to your um, so that the, so, so that the change might be significant for pathology. It's good to just show sometimes on the ECG. We learn through just memorizing patterns, and if you have this kind of ECG, which we use in Denmark, um, you will see that your reciprocal changes can be uh, remembered by this. They're like crossing like this, AV two and AVR, and then you have three and AVL. Okay, um, and the reciprocal stations here, V6 and um, V1, are are there. Um, you can, there are more detailed um, versions of this, and I'll show you. But I think these are the ones that you need to remember, and then, uh, like, then you can usually diagnose most of what you need to. The Swedish ECG looks like this for everyone looking living in Sweden, and if you want to just for international curiosity, um, the reason, the, the, the way the, the Swedish ECG is, is done is by um, doing a um, uh, average EC, uh, QRS, uh, like average P wave QRS and T, and just like s making a sum of all of them into one, um, one uh, QRS complex and making it uh, like they have V6 here. And then, so imagine you have all of your rhythm strips and then you just sum up it into one uh, generic uh, representative QRS complex um, uh, for that strip. Um, that is how this, this is made. This is also zoomed in, so to speak. This is 50 millimeters per second. So this is uh, much uh, wider for my gestalt, at least, who is, which is used to seeing the uh, quite smaller as uh, 25 millimeters per second, um, which is down here at the rhythm strip. So that's just a small introduction to your um, to um, uh, this Swedish ECG. Um, my friends usually say that you should uh, think of it uh, as the heart being here in the middle, and um, I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand that yet. But I'm sure some Swedish people might be able, Swedish doctors might be able to. Uh, tell me uh, or tell you guys if you're interested. Okay, so where we put our reciprocals here, they're, they're placed in a bit differently, um, but in general, you can find them at the um, opposite sides of the ECG here. Yeah. Okay. The reciprocals can be um, can be more detailed as well if you want that. Um, but I, I usually find that I have, har have a hard time remembering all of this, and um, and if I, I if I have the the main angers, um, the um, AVR two and the AVL three um, and the V one V six, then I can always kind of get why the the rest of them are are are. Um, um how how i would say that their the neighbor leads would, would look like um again um i would just wanted to show that avr does not have any uh, neighbor leads okay so let's go back to this um ecg that my friend kindly sent me and um, try to incorporate um so the STEMI criteria, the classical STEMI criteria, a ST elevation above one millimeter in any of the leads besides V2 and V3. Well, yes, there's that here, there's here, there's here, it's probably here, and um, there is um, there's definitely here and here, and then you have your um, uh, with a male um, below um, 40 years of age. Then you will have um, two millimeters of change, and then that's um, here you have two millimeters of change. I would I would say, which would be two small boxes, and here you definitely have it, and here as well. This is what you would probably call a tombstone, <laughs> a tombstone ST elevation, which is so, so large, um, but. That's the STEMI criteria, and then let's try to try to, try to put a bit more um, nuance into our diagnosis here. Um, so we already talked about the um, consecutive leads, and 
uh, for this ECG, the consecutive leads, consecutive leads are, are made up like this. Um, okay. Um, then you have the, um, you have um, ST elevation in the uh, consecutive leads here. And um, you have, um, sorry, I, I just <laughs> got confused because I remember that I made the color scheme wrong here. So these would be the inferior leads, which should be, have been yellow, I think, from the last lecture, uh, from the last slide. Um, and these are the uh, um, sepsal ones um, and the anterior ones, and, and these would be the lateral ones. Yeah, but you can see that in the um, in the anterior ones and the sepsal ones, you do have um, uh, neighbor leads. Uh, which are um, consecutively uh, ST, uh, ST ele elevated and also in the inferior ones. If we talk about the reciprocals, they are a bit different here. Um, but you remember that ABL and 2. Um, so a, a, um, an elevation here in 2 made a, a reciprocal change downwards here. Um, no reciprocal change here, though. Um, not. Uh, and 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 no real reciprocal change here. So maybe maybe this is an um, uh, these are small things that that you can um, tell the cardiologist as well. Then then we talk about dynamics. So there's definitely dynamics. You can talk about dynamics in symptoms in 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 uh, in um, in ECG changes and in troponins and. And here you have uh, ECG dynamic, where you have uh, ECG changes that um, um, change over time uh, to the worse. Um, and it could also be to the better, suggesting that something is happening, either re-occlusion uh, or reperfusion. Um, and then we have, uh, something we haven't talked that much about yet is the ratio. The ratio between the QRS complex and the T-wave. And the T-wave should be proportional to the QRS complex. Um, um, two take-home messages here. Um, if the T-wave is much larger, um, then it's not uh, proportional, and then it's it's pathological as, as a rule. Um, um, and the ST segment um, if the XT segment is low amplitude, then the sorry, if the QRS complex is low amplitude, then the ST elevation um, also has to, which should it should be proportionally um, uh, small amplitude, and and in and, and in low amplitude um, ECGs, we should be aware that it's harder to find the ST elevations uh, because the the findings are much smaller. Okay. Okay, so looking back at our checklist here, we've gone through the classical ST elevation criteria. We also crossed out the STEMI with the Q waves. Uh, it's important to know that, well, even though there are Q waves, uh, they might be still be salvageable heart. Um, and then you have your transient STEMIs, just because they had a, a STEMI before, but not not anymore. The dynamic can be re-perfusion, re, uh, doesn't have to be re-occlusion. So if you have a ECG that looks better now, doesn't mean that you shouldn't at least consider going to the cath lab because that might re-occlude any time. Okay, now for the rest of this lecture, let's try to go through the um, more or less known OMI um, um, positive criteria here so that you can pick them up in, in your own clinic. Okay, so let's talk about left bundle branch block and the right bundle branch block. Um, if we have a, if you have your normal ECG, um, and then then your the main thing about the bundle branch bundle branch blocks is that in your precordial leads, if you look towards the V1 and your V6, then you will uh, be able to uh, see that um, you have a morphological change of the QRS complex. And you, and you also have a wider QRS complex, meaning that in a 25 millimeter per second ECG, you will have more than three small boxes. 
and uh, more than three small boxes in in the horizontal plane and in a 50 millimeter millimeter per second the swedish kind um, you would have more than six small boxes so that would be a wide qrs complex and then when you know that the qrs complex is wide then you then you have to look at the morphology and um for for bundle branch block um, morphology looks like this that the left bundle branch block you will have a, a big v in v1 that is the mnemonic and then you you will have a reciprocal uh, looking um a, a mirror image of that almost an m configuration in the right bundle branch block you will have uh, the m configuration in the v1 uh, the RSR, um, and um, you will have this um, buckle handle kind of um, situation in the V6. That's how you distinguish the two. The two. And for me, uh, it's just something that you have to kind of remember, um, but it can be easier if you just know the, that you have to look at V1 and V6 and look for the broad uh, QRS complexes. Okay, so um, what does that, this have to do with OMI? Well, um, earlier we thought that we could just get everyone to the cath lab with a with a new left bundle branch block because we couldn't distinguish between the um, um, the um, the ones who had to go to the cath lab or not because we could not see STEMI. Um, but there are um, criteria now that can be used. Um, and these criteria are the um, what we call the Scarbosa criteria, and there's been modified Scarbosa criteria as well, which I will show you here. So you have um, um, three ECG criteria and one clinical criteria for the Scarbosa criteria, um, and the, um, the first criteria is that is that you need you need to look for concordant ST deviation. Concordant meaning that the QRS complex and the, t the and the um, ST um, uh, the ST part is going in the same direction that would be concordant um, uh, the disconcordant would be if it's uh, moving in in opposite direct opposite direction that the like the um, the gravity of the ECG is kind of in balance um, if you so if you have concordant deviation ST deviation meaning going with the QRS complex um, this is usually obvious because it does look like a STEMI. Um, um, this could be anywhere, or if you have in V1 to V3 and concordant, meaning going with the uh, general vector, the QRS complex here, going down in this case, um, ST depression here, um, then 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 you would consider it as Scarbosa positive. Then also you have your what you would call inappropriate disconcordance, meaning that um, there is a um, that disconcordant uh, ECGs, uh, oh, sorry, QRS complexes can be too much uh, disconcordant or disproportionate, uh, disproportionate disconcordant, and um, this is now a ratio uh, where it used to be uh, a, a set value, uh, but the modified um, Scarborosa criteria is now a ratio. So the ratio is done like this. So you, you, you measure your ST segment, which as we remember was the QRS complex at the J point, which put the, the first horizontal line after the QRS complex. And then you have look, take your isoelectric line and then you measure the ST, ST segment. And um, you take that value, in this case it's three millimeters, three small boxes. And in this case, it's 10 millimeters, 10 uh, small boxes or two big boxes. And then you divide the two. And the ratio here is 0 0.3. If the ratio is above 0 0.25, um, then it's inappropriate, disconcordant. And then you need to consider OMI and cath lab activation. Um, also, of course, it depends on, as, well, as always, the precess probability. So these are the three Scarbo modified Scarbosa criteria. Um, then you have, sorry, in Danish again here, but then you have your unstable patient. If you have a patient that does not 
uh, live up to any of these criteria, but is unstable maybe with pulmonary edema, as I had a patient here the other day with a new left bottom branch block that branch bottom branch block that was scabrosa negative, but was in pulmonary edema. Then you also have to um, activate the activate the cath lab or at least consider doing it. Um, and of course, you have to stabilize your patient first, but um, once stable, or if it cannot be stabilized without cath lab, then they should go to the cath lab according to these modified scabrosa criteria. Okay, so let's look at this ECG that we just looked at with these uh, new, there was new this new information. So the ECG here looks like a left bundle branch block um, because it has a fat is it's wide. And that's a V and V1, and it has a M-like configuration in V6. Okay. Um, then let's look at the um, Scarbosa criteria here, and this is um, something that I usually I don't always take out my ruler to check this out, but you can check it out here um, pretty easily just by looking at it. Sometimes it's obviously not below 25. Um, percent uh, of each other um, but here you might want to measure it and I measured this to four millimeters and this to 18 millimeters so um, that would that would be below 25 um, percent um, and you, this you should, you should do for all of these and uh, all of these would be uh, negative for this criteria then you have your in your v1 to v3 um, if there's any um, concordant ST depression and there is no such thing in this ECG and then you have your last criteria. Um, and in this particular ECG, it's quite easy to spot that there's an ST elevation here. Um, there are ST elevations in uh, uh, in lead two, uh, sorry, in AVR with uh, reciprocal depression in uh, two. And there is uh, elevation in AVL as well with reciprocal changes in, uh, uh, in lead three. So, here you uh, and even 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 in in AVF. So here you have um, a scabrosa positive, uh, modified scabrosa positive, and if you, this would be a cath lab excavation at my hospital. Okay, then let's look at the um, other um, <laughs> bundle branch block. Uh, here we have a right bunch of bundle branch block with the classical M configuration, and you have your kind of buckle handle in the V6. Um, the thing we need to, like always with a new right bundle branch block, we have to be aware that with any new ECG change with a patient with chest pain, we should be very, um, well, we're very aware that it might be an OMI. But um, these here we're looking at the more high risk um, features of the ECG, and for this to be even more high risk, we would need to have a left axis deviation, making it a um, 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 making it an OMI positive patient here. So the left axis deviation for those who uh, don't remember, there are different ways of measuring the the axis on on the heart. And just I'll just show one way here. There are different ways you can look at maybe life of the fast lane or other blocks showing this. But um, if you take the uh, uh, quadrant method here, then you then you look at um, the uh, then you look at AVF and you look at lead one, and if you have um, in in this case you have a, a positive deflection here, me meaning that you make a small point here and the positive here. If it was negative, you would go down out here, but this is positive, so you go here, and then you have your um, negative deflection here in the AVF. So you'll go on the negative side of this line. So you have one here and you have one here, making the general vector going around somewhere around here, meaning that the vector of the heart is turned to the left. So you have your left, so this would be a left axis. And if you have your right bundle branch block with a left axis, then that is a cath lab activation. Um, And that was what you would you what you would call um, bifascicular block. I think sometimes it's called trifascicular block, block, but I think that is a misnomer. Um, then 
then let's move on to the the the, the ECG OMI changes where you have um, insignificant ST um, deviation. And here it's really important to, to look about look at the um, reciprocals um, and the dynamics and uh, as I uh, just alluded to and the neighbors. So let's take a look at this uh, ECG here. This is a um, classical ECG, and this is probably one of the first that was like that, that was STEMI equivalent um, because of the reciprocal position of um, um, the V1 to V4, as I uh, alluded to before, where there are no um, leads on the back wall um, of the of the chest, um, only and the front, and that's why we have to be aware that. Any uh, um, ST depression in consecutive leads in V1 to V4 should, uh, with the right um, history and findings, should be considered a posterior um, um, infarction. Um, There is this trick where you invert uh, the ECG and flip it upside down, and then you will have. Um, obvious um, uh, ST elevations um, on the ECG. Another way to uh, a way to gain a bit more confidence in this diagnosis, um, to be a bit more specific but but um, low sens sensitive, then it would be to put a V7 to V9 on. In this lower aspect of the scapula you'll just below that you'll you'll put v8 in in between um v6 and v8 you'll put v7 which would usually be in the axilla and then the v9 would be just um, to the left of the spinal uh sorry the col col uh, column um, um spinal column yeah um the thing is though with this is that even um, 0 0.5 millimeters of ST elevation in these leads, um, it's really hard to. It's, it's not sensitive enough. There's there's false false negative, uh, even if you do this, and it's quite logical why there might this might be so because it's we're talking really really small changes and it's easy to to miss a half small box of ST elevation. This is another ECG where um, where you have more subtle ST depression in V1 to V4, and this is um, a ECG where you have V8 and V9, um, and here you can see ST elevation, which does make the diagnosis a bit more uh, likely, but you cannot rule out. A posterior infarction. Uh, so, if you do see the changes that we just saw on that ECG, we you would consider activating the cath lab. Okay, so that was the posterior MI. Let's move on to this uh, change here. Here, this was an ECG that I showed you before, um, where we <laughs> that I used for our Bayesian case in the beginning of this lecture, part one, and here we see that there are ST elevations in lead two, three, and AVF, which would be, um, but but the changes in uh, the inferior leads are often um, not um, below above one millimeter. It's kind of hard to make out, and this is because it's a kind of a low quality picture. But in general, this might be insignificant. And here it's important to look at the reciprocals AVR and AVL. If you um, uh, all, uh, so, so if you have any change in 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 AV um, L uh, reciprocal change here, and you have elevation in AV uh, sorry in, in lead two, then that is uh, highly um, suspicious. Um, and. And vice versa as well here. So, if you have ST elevation in AVL and ST depression in lead three, then it's kind of these are kind of uh, twin uh, twin uh, OMI criteria because uh, they 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 get at the same thing. Okay. 
So let's try to look at um, this ECG instead. This is a um, what if we only in most of these ECGs I will not do a thorough uh, examination or thorough systematic evaluation. I will usually just go through where the money is, um, looking for the crit for the ST elevations, the uh, Q waves, the uh, T waves, and the if there's a left bundle branch block, looking for dynamics, left looking for recipro reciprocals. Uh, uh, sorry, not looking for dynamics, but looking for reciprocals, looking for ratios um, and contiguous leads um, changes. So here we see a diffuse SC depression in most of these leads. Um, and that might not be a cath lab activation in general, but what we do see and what does make this ECG special is that there is an ST elevation AVR which did not have any consecutive leads and therefore is not um, a classical STEMI positive patient. Okay, so, but this is a highly, um, uh, this is usually a highly um, ab abnormal ECG, it to goes to the cath lab. So that would be the, um, then you have your, um, then you have this patient where you usually the young patients, uh, young males with big hearts, uh, ST elevation patients, where you where you might have like big um, waves here in the uh, precordial leads, and um, you'll have these uh, what you would call um, concave ST elevation, which usually is a good th good sign that they're concave and not uh, convex, but um, in reason, sometimes it's hard to make out whether this is a uh, cath lab activation or just re early repolarization. And in this case, um, I, I will always go to um, a Metcal, because um, Dr. Smith has, has improved on this um, calculator for subtle anterior STEMI, uh, where you can plot in the um, the, the data and, and and see that whether there, whether it's a whether it's it it has a high enough score for this being an OMI activation. Of course, many of these scores that I'm showing, they have a sensitivity as well. OMI criteria has a sensitivity as well as we showed in the beginning. So, um, you always have to consider that uh, that. The, the tests you are doing might be falsely negative. So if you have a high pre-test probability the patient in front of you is diaphoretic, smoking history, even though if they're young, then you might consider either doing dynamic ECGs with troponins, uh, dynamic troponins, or um, if there's really high risk, uh, consider activating the cath lab anyway if their pain cannot be relieved and they're typically uh, anginal pains. Okay. That is something alluded to here, down here, in unrelieved pain with non-STEMI. Okay. So so far, we have we've now looked at the the um, classical, the uh, the bundle branch blocks, and then the insignificant ST uh, deviations um, that might uh, trigger us to to. Uh, uh, trigger us to to activate the cath lab, and here the one of the key words was reciprocal changes. Um, yeah. Then you have the remaining ones, which are which I what I call the funky T waves. Um, here we have a. Um, this is where we want to check out the ratios. Let's. What stands out in this ECG? Well. Well, I guess the, the 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 ratio is kind of off. That is what stands out, I would say. Um, if you have your QRS complex here, then you would you would think that the T wave should be quite small, and and here the T wave also should be smaller at least than the QRS wave here. More appropriate like this and like this, but but here there. Are, are quite big, maybe not so much here, but especially in these two leads. Um, and this is what we would call hyperacute um, T waves. Um, they can sometimes morphologically be differentiated from the other thing that might create high T waves, which would be hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia often being said that hyperkalemia is like a, a T wave that is a bit uh, more pointy it's a, it's a T wave that you do, do not want to sit on. 
um, where this is a, is a bit more um, muscular, or what we call it, a bit more buffy, a bit more white, and, um, and not as pointy. Um, but um, in, if you're in doubt and if the history is right, then I would definitely consider doing a potassium on some of these patients. This is usually something that happens um, um, uh, where, you, where you need to, um, this is not a definite PCI activation, cat lab activation, um, but it's definitely something that where, where you need to um, consider calling the, 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 the cath lab for, for a suggestion. Um, also notice that many of these ECGs tell us that this is normal sinus rhythm and normal ECG. Um, and the, um, the robot uh, is differently programmed for different uh, companies. Uh, they have different sensitivity and specificity, and usually they're not that sensitive or not that specific. At least you should um, never trust a computer. Um, and, uh, and when they say there is high patholo highly, patho highly pathological uh, ECGs, Meaning, uh, then then you should not always believe them and and vice versa here a normal they, here where they where they say it's normal they should they should not necessarily believe that they're normal amoma 2 um usually says that well there are there are um <laughs> they're programmed by plaintiff lawyers uh, which would make sense in the united states um so his, his point being don't um don't trust them okay um, so that would be the um, hyperacute C waves. Then you have um, this phenomenon, um, which is most, um, which 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 is uh, uh, seen uh, most uh, obviously here. Um, it's a um, V4. No, sorry, it's it's, it's a um, if you if you take the J point here meaning that QRS complex and then where it goes horizontal and you have a ST uh, depression here in the precoriolates and that goes up into a T wave meaning having this like kind of slopey look um, going from ST depression into a T, uh, a T wave. This is a classical sign for um, what you would call a De Winters uh, T wave and this is highly uh, pathological and it should be uh, considered um, to go to the cath lab directly. What you also see in this ECG is that there is ST elevation in AVL, uh, which I uh, previously said that any ST elevation in AVL and ST depression the reciprocal in uh, lead 3 should be um, highly suspicious for high lateral um, um, high lateral um, OMI, and that is also what the um, uh, uh, this one says. Okay, moving on to um, this uh, these ECGs, and this is um, there are two signs here, and this is um, th this sign can, can is usually something that you see with re or re uh, reperfusion just after the patient has had their chest pain and you take this ECG and then um, after the relieved chest pain you might see this. So what we see here, there, there are two kinds here. There, you, either you have your uh, biphasic T wave in the precordial leads or you have your or very deep T waves in in the um, precordial leads. Um, me being um, schooled in neurology, uh, I would uh, usually think that these might be cerebral T waves. But uh, for instance, like with a subarachnoid. But um, recently, I've I've learned as well that these can be these deep T waves, suggesting Wallens syndrome, um, which would be um, type A and type B Wallens syndrome. Um, okay, I haven't mentioned that this um, this sheet can be found at if you Google EM crit cheat sheet, and this particular one I've borrowed from Scott Weingart's research, uh, Scott Weingart et al.'s uh, resource crisis manual, but it's the same one that you can find on the cheat sheet. 
uh, on EMCRIT for free. So now we've gone through all of these and what we um, have not, what we're missing now is, is the um, on the relief pain um, with non STEMI. And this alludes to the fact that we always have to, no matter what the ECG shows, look at the patient, look at their, uh, listen to their history and assess the pretest probability for differential diagnoses. And if the troponin comes back and, and it's normal and the ECG looks okay, if you have a very suggestive history, in some cases you might need to consider going on with a, with a uh, with a um, PCI, um, but in general, usually these patients would be admitted for dynamic ECGs if you're concerned for them or look for a different differential. Okay, um, so this is what what we call pre test probability assessment. So just to conclude. Um, as a small checklist here, um, besides the checklist that I just showed you, um, before looking at ECGs, you would, you would consider the precess probability. Is the patient unstable? Other classical uh, chest pain without relief of uh, nitro uh, puffs? Is there, uh, do they have any early ECGs to compare with? And might they have atypical presentations for ACS? which would usually be women, diabetics, and elderly, as well as neurological um, frail, for instance, with aphasia or dysphasia. Uh, here, the atypical presentation is typical, um, meaning that the majority of patients, for instance, women, um, might present um, differently than men, um, and usually they, will, they might present with more flu-like symptoms, more vague or more um, multiple symptoms um, like a dyspnea, uh, or if they become elderly, maybe even non specific complaints. So, something to be aware of. Um, then, looking at uh, ST elevations, you should look at these changes specific specifically. Looking at ST depressions, you should look at these changes, the funky T waves at these, and then look at for. Uh, bundle branch blocks and always looks for the neighbors, the reciprocals, the dynamics, and the ratios, which I hope you, I, I might have given you uh, some ways to to remember. Um, if you follow this link, you, you will find the uh, EMC's uh, chapter seven on STEMI equivalence, which I from time to time look up just to re uh, just to practice this again because there's a lot of things to remember here and. Um, uh, just to for 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 space repetition that this is a quick um, quick learning tool. This is the last slide, and just to show you that um, if you want to know more about this, if there's something that I might have missed, then please comment. Um, if there's something I have said that was wrong, then also please comment. I am not, I'm not perfect at all. I just want to share with you this um, knowledge and then we can discuss the details of it. Um, if you want, especially if you want to, if you're more interested in this OMI concept, then I would suggest that you go into Dr. Smith's ECG blog and look at his videos as he, he updates the information um, quite often. And, um, read the Oh My Manifesto for the more detailed background about this. People like Simon Carley and um, uh, Casey Parker of Broom Dogs or, or um, Justin Morgenstern of First 10 EM or, or Jerome Hoffman, they talk a lot about the Bayesian way of thinking and um, they, they, they incorporate, uh, as I try to incorporate uh, it, this into my lectures, they incorporate it as well, because it's such an important factor, or sorry, it's such an important um, concept that, 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 that um, goes into everything that we do. So if you want to know more about the like, basic concepts of Bayesian thinking, um, then I suggest to seeing, seeing either on my blogs uh, on my videos on this topic, or um, I, I, as for instance, the headache video, and then or also the Bastion video from Broom Dogs. Um, 
if you want to talk about it more in um, in cardiology um, and emergency ECGs, then I would suggest looking at some of Simon Carly's videos. For instance, the risk factors factor, also Gestalt a video from SMAC, um, and and several other videos that he made both in SMAC and on St. Limbs blog. Um, I highly highly recommend these. Um, if you're interested in the concept of signal and noise, um, then I would recommend to you Nate Silver's blog. And um, in general, probabilistic thinking and um, and all of these concepts, I would um, recommend going into um, acutemedicine.dk's YouTube channel, where we have, uh, um, for instance, Eric Driver uh, talking about probabilistic thinking in English as well. Okay, so that's it for for now. I, I am happy if you made it this far, and uh, thank you so much.